I've heard a lot of people asserting that 2019 was a weak year for video games. It's probably not that this year was weak as much as the last several have been so strong. There were definitely great games in 2019. It's just that a lot of them weren't for me or didn't hold my interest like they did for others. I found a repeated pattern this year. Games that started strong but fizzled out by the end. I found myself finishing them more for the sake of completion than passion or pure enjoyment. At least part of that is me, because it happened with games that people raved about. Maybe I'm spoiled, maybe the last several years have been replete with amazing games that resonated with me in such a way that merely pretty good games just feel lackluster by comparison. I'm really not sure. So while I can wholeheartedly say that a lot of really neat, well-designed games came out in 2019, I had a tough time finding ones that I was actually passionate about. Nevertheless, here are my thoughts on the games of 2019. Disappointments, honorable mentions, and my personal best games list. Like I said last year, disappointments don't mean bad games. I rarely play actually bad games, and I never finish them. This part of the list is about decent or even good games that are nonetheless disappointing to me in some way personally. They are games I felt could have been more, or were held back by critical issues. It pains me to report that Wargroove is a personal disappointment. I've been looking forward to this game for years because it postures itself as the spiritual successor to Advance Wars that Nintendo refuses to make. It's really tricky to tap into the spirit of another franchise. How closely do you adhere to the design of the original? How much do you change or add? Wargroove swaps the modern military aesthetic for medieval fantasy, but it keeps the general design of its turn-based strategy predecessor. It looks a lot like Advance Wars. It plays a lot like Advance Wars. But the devil is in the details. There are a couple big hang-ups I have with the design of Wargroove. In the main campaign, enemy units will just poof into existence on the battlefield during some missions. That means you have very little advanced warning about what you're up against. That feels really terrible in a tactics game, particularly one as challenging as Wargroove. I don't like having commanders on the battlefield. They're powerful units that function like the king in chess. If either side loses their commander, they lose the battle. But being too cautious with your commander will likely lead to defeat as well, and that's a very tricky line to learn to walk. I just never found that risk-reward proposition fun. I don't like how most missions feel like an exercise in manipulating the AI. It feels more like puzzle solving, less like fighting a battle. I don't like how healing works. I don't like that the different factions have different names for the same type of units. It's really confusing unnecessarily. I don't like the emphasis on critical hits. I don't like that you can't occupy buildings. At launch, there was no way to save and reload mid-battle, and that meant you could never boldly experiment without risking having to start over from the beginning. My understanding is that this has been addressed in patches since, but the damage was done for me. And none of these choices are bad, per se. They don't make Wargroove a bad game. They just make it feel less like Advance Wars. I want to stress that Wargroove is not a bad game. I know it isn't. It's extremely well made and offers tons of content, as well as a robust set of content creation tools. That's great. This game was clearly made with a lot of love and care, but it just doesn't scratch the Advance Wars itch. And that's all I really wanted. I may go back to this game at some point and completely change my tune on it, but for now, it's a disappointment. The problem with Control is that it's merely a pretty good third-person action game, but it hints at being much more. I can't shake the feeling that it's a missed opportunity. The strange world it presents doesn't fundamentally change the way you play. It's window dressing. The extra-dimensional elements justify standard game mechanics. There's an amazing setup for a game, but Control feels content to begin and end there. The oldest house, home of the Federal Bureau of Control, supposedly has a mind of its own, shifting pieces around without notice and revealing new areas. But while you play, the map layout is entirely fixed. Imagine if the whole game world had been a mind-bending puzzle space. Imagine if the plot wasn't building entirely on tropes we've seen a hundred times before. Imagine if the twists in this game were actually interesting. If Control were a stand-up routine, it would be a lot of setups, some development, but no punchlines. At least none that you haven't heard before. 
From a pure plot standpoint, it's as boilerplate as they come. The window dressing of weirdness only helps distract from this for so long. It's possible that a sequel could really be worth playing, but it's also possible that there's nothing a writer could come up with that would flesh this world out in an interesting way. To use the parlance of the game, there's nothing behind the poster. Nothing but a pretty good third-person shooter. That's fine, but it's not what they promise you when you enter the oldest house. I had never played Link's Awakening before this remake, so it was a totally new experience for me. I heard a lot of people buzzing that this was one of the best traditional Zelda games, and I just don't agree with that. There's nothing markedly better about this game than Minish Cap or the Oracle games, and it certainly doesn't hold a candle to A Link to the Past. Link's Awakening is impressive because of how much it did with the primitive hardware of the original Game Boy back in 1993. It's got some great dungeons and a tight, efficient world to explore, but it's also irritatingly claustrophobic. After the freedom of Breath of the Wild and the previous overhead game, A Link Between Worlds, old Zelda feels so restrictive. The world of Link's Awakening is much smaller than those games, but moving around it is a chore instead of a joy. The game is terrible at communicating to the player. It asks you to do things you would never into it on your own. I found myself constantly using the built-in hint system. Backtracking across the whole map to find the one thing I missed is not what I want out of a Zelda game. It's kind of neat how faithful this remake is, but it's also disappointing that it doesn't offer anything new, other than a fresh coat of paint, some better controls, and a half-baked dungeon creator, which isn't a lot of fun since it just recycles parts from dungeons you've already beaten. In contrast to a different remake we'll talk about later, the developers didn't take advantage of the opportunity to smooth over some of the game's wrinkles and intelligently modernize the game while keeping the original spirit intact. I would have loved to see some innovation and renovation rather than slavish devotion to recreating an old game. Based on the pitch alone, The Outer Worlds is a game I was certain to love. It's an action RPG that crosses Bethesda first-person games with the structure of a classic Bioware game from the company that made two of the best games in those respective styles. What's not to love? And I did love it, for about half the game. There are some good characters, well-written quests, and compelling choices here, but after a while I just didn't care about the universe of the Outer Worlds anymore. It's not open-ended enough to get lost in, and the central story doesn't have enough intrigue and surprise to sustain its length. The magic of Fallout New Vegas and Bethesda games in general is that everything is essentially in one big map. You can wander around at your own pace and find a huge variety of things without ever being directed to do so by the game. You can definitely get a little bit of this in the Outer Worlds, but with the game being broken up into so many smaller maps rather than a single large one, much of that sense of exploration is lost. Early in the Outer Worlds, there's an objective that requires you decide with one faction or another. In order to get what you need, you're going to have to make somebody unhappy. I wanted to learn as much as I could about each side of the conflict so I could make an educated decision, even though it was fairly apparent who the good guys and bad guys were right away. There aren't nearly enough difficult choices in the game. You can pretty much get all the factions to like you if you do enough side quests for them, until the inevitable points in the end game where you have to make your final choice about which faction you'll side with. In general, the game is easy. It feels too easy to get into restricted areas. It feels too easy to solve people's problems. It feels too easy to make everyone more or less happy. When all of this stuff comes so easily, when you remove the struggle and challenge from the game, it all starts to feel inconsequential, and suddenly I found myself not caring about almost any of it. It's apparent early on that the corporate overlords running the Halcyon colony are horribly abusive of their workers. They're painted as the bad guys from the word go. I kept waiting for things to get more complicated, more interesting, but every time I thought it would, I was disappointed. There are a few compelling factions and locations, but they're the exception. The Outer Worlds covers well-trodden ground. It feels like an aesthetic hodgepodge of Bioshock, Fallout, and Borderlands. The result is something that's generally kind of generic in its ideas and visuals. Big, bad, abusive organizations, corporate or otherwise, are all over video games, particularly RPGs and science fiction games. I'm not one to say keep politics or social issues out of games, 
Games are an art form, and art can explore anything. I just want games that decide to tackle those issues to do it in a thought-provoking way. The Outer Worlds engages with labor issues and politics mostly on a surface level. Its constantly cheeky tone undercuts any attempts at treating these ideas with more depth and complexity. I think many will really enjoy The Outer Worlds. It's well made and doesn't suffer from some of the blights that have plagued previous Obsidian games. I got a fair amount of enjoyment from it myself, but I also finished the game out of a sense of obligation to see it through, and I had totally lost connection with the game by the time the credits rolled. Now on to the honorable mentions. These are games I enjoyed, but perhaps I admire them more than I actually love them. They have great ideas, great presentation, but fall short of being among my top games this year. The third game in the underappreciated Metro series broadens its scope with bigger levels and more outdoor areas. It's still a linear progression of discrete levels rather than an open world, but the levels themselves allow you some freedom to explore and go at your own pace. Only a few of the levels are actually designed with this new philosophy in mind, though. Many of them are still linear levels like in the previous two games. I'm really okay with that. There have been plenty of open world games, and I think this middle lane, a game with sort of medium-sized levels, is something we haven't seen much of recently. Plus, the Metro series has always been pretty good at linear level design, and that's the case again here. What really does benefit this game and the series as a whole is the change of setting. After two games in Moscow's Metro system, you get out of the tunnels and out of the city on a cross-country tour of Russia. The variety is fantastic to see, and it kept me hooked. I wanted to know where things were going geographically and narratively. As the third game of the series, there was an expectation that it would wrap up a trilogy. The end is satisfying, but it leaves the door open should 4A games want to return to the universe. I hope they try their hand at some new ideas. I don't mean that as a slight on the Metro series, I mean it as a compliment to the team that built these games. Now seems like a great time for them to try a new IP, or even a new genre. At a glance, Katana Zero looks like a side-scrolling take on Hotline Miami. Upon further inspection, it still looks like that. Its fast-paced sudden-death combat, lo-fi aesthetic, bright neon color palette, mysterious narrative, and pulsing electronic soundtrack are all directly inspired by Hotline Miami. Or if they're not, I'd be shocked. While Katana Zero seems a little derivative, it ultimately distinguishes itself with excellent gameplay, level design, and a unique narrative presentation. The main differentiation from other games in this style is a time-slowing mechanic, which starts out feeling overpowered, but becomes absolutely critical to completing the game's later, tougher levels. I was surprised how much I got sucked in by the story, and just how much the gameplay and story support each other. There's not only good narrative justification for your time-slowing powers, there's some fascinating ideas explored as a result. Baba Is You is the best pure puzzle game I've played in ages. It does what all good puzzle games should. It makes you feel like an idiot until you solve the puzzle and feel like a genius. The game combines good old-fashioned block-pushing puzzles with logic manipulation. The title comes from the basic rule set of most levels, Baba is you, meaning you, the player, control this sheep character called Baba. Other typical rules are things like wall is stop, door is shut, key is open. By sliding around these nouns, verbs, and adjectives, you can dramatically change things and find radical solutions to the problems presented. It's deceptively complex. Some puzzles will have you baffled, trying different approaches over and over, while others reveal themselves surely and steadily. Eventually, the game got a little too obtuse for me. There were a few subtler mechanics I didn't pick up just by playing. What's the point of a puzzle game if you have to look up solutions to progress? Still, I enjoyed my time with Baba Is You immensely. It's one of the most creative and fresh games of the year, which is an astounding thing to say about a sliding block puzzle game. Geese are awful. And in Untitled Goose Game, you get to be one of the little troublemakers running around and ruining people's days. It taps into something that video games are really good at. Mischief. Usually making mischief in games is a secondary thing. Something you can do, but is very much not the point of the game. Well, it's the entire point of this one, and it's glorious. 
Untitled Goose Game reminds me of the recent Hitman games with its combination of forgiving stealth and puzzle solving. Like in those games, the world and its inhabitants are the puzzle. Instead of killing targets, you're given a list of objectives that are basically a bunch of ways to annoy people and cause trouble. Some are fairly obvious, while others require you to cleverly manipulate people and objects in concert. It's a short game, but that's a good thing. It's ultimately much more limited than Hitman, and unfortunately not as replayable. It's another one of those games that should be experienced with as little foreknowledge as possible. This was such a nice surprise, unlike geese themselves. Ape Out combines a frenetic Saul Bass-inspired graphic design aesthetic with rhythmic improvisational jazz. It's a mesmerizing combo. It's just so cool that video games can look and sound like this now. The goal is to guide the ape through maze-like levels, avoiding or killing enemies along the way. You can attack or grab gun-wielding humans, but combat isn't the point, and you're often better off going in the opposite direction rather than taking a head-on approach. The general layout of mazes are fixed, but the individual placement of walls and enemies is procedural, changing each time you die so that mazes can't be memorized. The ape moves with weight and momentum. It's responsive, but it always feels just on the verge of being out of control. The controls and randomized layouts keep things feeling loose and improvisational, just like the music and visuals. The game is simple, but it's so unique and harmonious. Ape Out is the most stylish game I played all year. The creators had a strong aesthetic vision, and they pulled it off beautifully. It's a great example of how a simple gameplay premise can be elevated into a unique and cohesive aesthetic experience by an amazing audiovisual treatment. I wanted so badly for Nintendo to port Super Mario Maker to the Switch. It's one of the Wii U's best and most unique games. Instead, they made a full-fledged sequel with a bunch of new content. A new game style, new level themes, new course parts and options, a story mode with Nintendo-created levels, and a whole lot of other changes and additions. In some ways, it was two steps forward and one step back. For all its faults, the Wii U was perfectly suited to Mario Maker, and the conversion to the Switch wasn't quite as smooth as I'd hoped. The best way to make levels is to buy a capacitive stylus and do it handheld like you would with the Wii U, but some of the controls and UI alterations make this a little bit less efficient. It definitely works though, and the only reason this is even an issue is because I've played the original game where level creation was just a bit smoother. It's awesome to see what people can make out of the tools here, and to try your own hand at course creation too. I was disappointed that I didn't have as much creative juice for making new levels as I thought I would, but that's not really the game's fault. I hope to get back to Mario Maker 2 in the new year, and I hope Nintendo keeps supporting it with new content. It's one of the coolest and best new IPs they've come up with in ages. I must have been really hungry for a single-player, story-driven Star Wars game, because despite its many issues, I ate this up. Ultimately, I have a love-hate relationship with Jedi Fallen Order, but the parts I love are so much stronger than the parts I don't. Respawn mashed up Dark Souls combat with Tomb Raider platforming and climbing, and Metroid world design. It's a bizarre tonic. One moment you'll be locked in a parry-heavy combat encounter, and the next you're sliding, jumping, and wall-running for your life. Jedi Fallen Order is certainly easier than a true Souls game, but it's not necessarily a good gateway drug for getting into the Souls-like genre. The game does a terrible job at teaching you how to play correctly. The tutorials are poor and rushed. Mixed groups of ranged and melee enemies get thrown at you much too early for beginners. The game is also unpolished and poorly optimized in places. It was almost certainly rushed out the door to meet some kind of internal company deadline. Performance dips are common, which can be a real detriment while platforming or fighting, both of which require precision timing. The camera is also really bad at times, and the game has a nasty habit of making you fight enemies in tight spaces where you don't have much room to maneuver. That said, the traditional Star Wars elements are where this game really shines. The story, characters, and big moments all work, and the game is generally well paced. It's an engrossing premise. You assume the role of a young Jedi who escaped the Purge and is on the run from the Empire, which is hunting down any remaining Jedi. Cal Kestis is one of the best Star Wars protagonists in a long time. 
He's relatable and sympathetic. He's a good person, but he still has flaws and room for character growth. The game explores the emotional and spiritual trauma of essentially living through genocide, which is really heavy subject matter for Star Wars. While the gameplay is a mixed bag, it clicks often enough, and when it does, it's just such a cool experience. The boss fights are dramatic high points, the puzzles are good, and by the end of the game you have a variety of weapon options and force powers to mix things up. Design issues and technical polish aside, it's impressive that Respawn, a developer that's worked exclusively on first-person shooters so far, was able to pull off a compelling, story-driven third-person action game. While it may not be saying a lot, this is the best Star Wars game in a long, long time. I would love to see what they could do with another Star Wars title, maybe one that's a little more in their wheelhouse. Now it's time for the best games. Here are my top 5 favorites of 2019. Between the two giant Japanese horror game franchises, Silent Hill and Resident Evil, I've long been on Team Silent Hill. It always seemed like the smarter, classier franchise, with a greater emphasis on thematic complexity and psychological horror, instead of blood and guts. I held those opinions based almost entirely on reputation, rather than first-hand experience. In that distant, dismissive assessment, I missed the fact that Resident Evil was founded on eliciting fear and tension through its game design as much as its visuals. There's a smartly designed game underneath a layer of intentionally corny, over-the-top horror aesthetics. And that's pretty cool. Resident Evil knows how to have fun and scare the player, sometimes simultaneously. The series ventured away from survival horror into action over the years, but Resident Evil 7 was a return to form, and the 2019 remake of Resident Evil 2 is naturally in that vein as well. I have no experience with or affinity for the original game. I came to this purely on the strength of the demo that was made available, and I really enjoyed my time with RE2. For me, it strikes a good balance between remake and reimagining. You can tell it hails from an older era of gaming, but it looks and plays like a modern game. Capcom was able to keep what was special about the original wave of survival horror games, and ditch a lot of what makes those old games hard to go back to. RE2 is scary not necessarily because of the monster design or the creepy atmosphere, it's scary because each encounter with a monster is a potential drain on your limited resources. You can spin bullets on the zombie in front of you now, but you might wish you had that ammo later on. Even if the player becomes desensitized to the grotesque appearance of the monsters, they still create effective tension, effective horror. I love how deliberate everything is in RE2. The shooting is a great example. You can't just fire from the hip and expect a hit. Accurate aim takes longer than you're used to in shooter games. And you better not waste ammo because items are finite. The game's excellent map not only keeps you from getting lost, it prevents you from aimless backtracking too. That's vital to a good experience because moving around can be pretty stressful and you want to make sure, especially in the later game, that everything you're doing, all the risks you're taking, have specific purpose. Eventually RE2 shifts from survival horror to action horror. It's really freeing, really empowering when the game finally gives you permission to unload the arsenal that you've been collecting and saving. Ultimately, I love how these games force you to learn to be cool under pressure, to overcome the dread, and deal with the unknown and unexpected and Resident Evil 2 excels at everything survival horror is about. Luigi's Mansion 3 is a classic Nintendo game full of charm, polish, and solid level design. The company has a long track record of making games where the basic mechanics feel good, even apart from the game they're designed for. In the case of Mario games, that means running and jumping. For his neglected younger brother, it's using a ghost-sucking vacuum. The real trick isn't the vacuum itself, which does take some getting used to and can feel a bit clumsy to control at times. No, the real trick is the reactive environments around Luigi. Start waving that vacuum around a room and everything responds to your presence. That reactivity encourages experimentation, which is essential to progressing through the game, and the extra curious will be rewarded with secrets. I'm no completionist, but I went after an awful lot of secrets and extras in this game because discovering them was such a joy. Luigi's Mansion has always been a charming series, but the first game was an all too brief experience, and the second outstayed its welcome. The third game is just right. Set in a haunted hotel, each floor functions as its own separate area with distinct theming. That makes for easily digestible chunks of gameplay, 
and keeps things feeling fresh throughout the experience. If I had to describe this game in one word, it would be lively. The way the physics objects react to your vacuum, the pleasing way characters animate both in and out of cutscenes, and the creative design of the game's mini bosses all contribute to this feeling. It's super appealing to look at, and it draws you in. I've described Luigi's Mansion 3 as a Nintendo game, but it was actually developed by Next Level Games, an independent studio in Canada. And it's a tribute to their efforts that I would have never suspected this wasn't from Nintendo proper. Tetris is one of the best video games of all time. Unlike most 35-year-old games, it's still a ton of fun to play. Tetris is timeless. Over the years, it's been wrapped in all kinds of packages. Multiplayer Tetris, 3D Tetris, Tetris mixed with other puzzle games. Out of nowhere, Nintendo gave us a brand new spin on Tetris this year, Battle Royale Tetris. This is a brilliant application of the Battle Royale concept, which has pretty much been exclusive to the shooter genre until now. In standard Tetris, you're always playing to lose. Eventually, you'll make some mistakes, the pieces will fall too fast, and you'll top out. The allure is the simple joy of making lines, and chasing a higher score than you've had before. Casting the game in a battle royale model gives an achievable but still very challenging end goal to Tetris. It speeds up the gameplay, and it gives you a different standard by which to measure success. It takes the established rules of Tetris and versus Tetris, and imbues them with new life. It's such a simple yet brilliant way to extend the Tetris experience. If that had been all that Tetris 99 ended up being, then it would have been notable. What makes it one of the best games of the year are all the ways it incentivized players to keep playing, even if you never become that one person out of 99 to win it all. Tournaments, extra themes, new modes, and daily challenges kept me coming back to the game all year long. Last year I featured Nintendo Switch Online in my list of disappointments. Tetris 99 was the first sign that that was turning around. However disappointing the rest of the service might be, it is the only place to get one of 2019's best games. Destiny 2 didn't come out in 2019, but it was nevertheless a big year for this game. In addition to all the regular content drops and the annual expansion, Bungie broke free from Activision and switched the game to a free-to-play model, thereby widening the player base and likely ensuring continuing support for years to come. But Destiny 2 isn't on my list because of the free-to-play move, or the Shadowkeep expansion. It's here because it's the thing that finally made me realize the appeal of a live game. Sort of. In general, I don't play many online multiplayer games. I prefer to play a variety of games to see the breadth of what's out there. And online games, especially live service games, demand your time and attention in a way that traditional games just don't. Destiny 2 isn't any more welcoming to newcomers, or returning players in my case, than the rest. In fact, it's pretty esoteric for such a popular game. I did an awful lot of searches to figure out what cryptic dialogue and quest logs referred to and how less obvious mechanics worked. I still don't know what a lot of it means, I just know it's fun to play. Destiny has always had exquisite shooting mechanics. It just feels great. And since coming to PC, I can play it on my preferred shooter platform at an amazingly smooth and steady frame rate. I really appreciate great fundamentals like that, especially in a year where so many games seem to fizzle out for me, and some major releases performed terribly, even on decently powerful hardware. All of this was true at launch, but there wasn't a whole lot for casual players to do after finishing the campaign. Now there's no shortage of unique and repeatable content, there's a whole new type of PvP activity, several additional campaigns, and a bunch of different ways to get better gear and customize it to your liking. I still don't care about the Destiny story. I couldn't tell you what's going on or why any of it matters. But it doesn't matter to me. Destiny is the game I can fall back on when I just need to unwind. Whether I want to play it more intentionally, going after specific quests and objectives, or whether I just want to veg for a bit, Destiny is the perfect option for both. This game is best experienced with as little foreknowledge as possible. In an effort to preserve what's special about this game for those who haven't played it, I'm going to be vague and not show a lot of footage until after a spoiler warning. Outer Wilds was an utterly profound experience. 
Most science fiction gestures at big ideas and profound themes, but end up settling for more crowd-pleasing convention in the end. From a narrative and thematic standpoint, Outer Wilds is one of the best sci-fi games ever made, and that's more than enough to make it my 2019 game of the year. It's a game that doesn't hold the player's hand. That's mostly a good thing, but it can be frustrating figuring out the possibility space within the confines of the game's mechanical structure. To say more would risk giving away some of the mystery. The game's ambition, the way it emphasizes ideas and knowledge, the way its whole solar system is a dynamic, shifting puzzle box, and the game's emotionally and intellectually satisfying story made it well worth putting up with a few frustrations. If you're at all interested in space, exploration, puzzles, science, speculative fiction, or grand philosophical questions, you should absolutely try Outer Wilds. And you should stop watching now because I'm about to spoil a little more of this game, and it's a game worth discovering for yourself. For those unconvinced, or who have already played it, here are a few more thoughts on the game, and a lot more footage. Outer Wilds is built around the concept of a 22-minute time loop. At the end of that cycle, the sun explodes, destroying the entire solar system, and you return to the start of the loop, memories intact. In Outer Wilds, you make progress by learning about the universe and how it works. There are no permanent upgrades, nothing you do carries over across time loops. You can only take your knowledge with you. The time loop is integral to the game, but it's also the cause of some of my frustrations. In a game about exploration and discovery, I prefer to take my time, and the 22 minute loop means you can't always do that. This frustration put me off the game for a bit, but I eventually came back to finish it, and I'm so glad I did. It's so different from the recent crop of space exploration games like No Man's Sky or Elite Dangerous, which emphasize the massive scale of their respective universes. Outer Wilds' explorable solar system is much smaller, but each celestial body is utterly unique, handcrafted, and strange. Outer Wilds proves that you can still make the player feel small and insignificant without a vast, procedurally generated universe. Its exploration of metaphysics does a far better, more efficient job of that. Figuring out how the universe works, what's going on, and finding purpose or making peace with what you find is the ultimate goal of the game, but it's never explicitly spelled out. The game doesn't signpost the critical path, it wants you to find it yourself. Outer Wilds plays with some really cool science and science fiction concepts. They're far more than just window dressing for the story. These concepts impact your understanding of the game's universe and how you move through it. The game's true ending is surprisingly satisfying, meaningful, and beautiful. I've never played anything else quite like it. The best games make you think about more than video games. Outer Wilds encouraged me to dwell on the wonder of existence itself. So that's another year in the books. Thanks for watching. Even though 2019 wasn't quite as good as previous years in games, I still appreciate all the titles I talked about, even the disappointing ones. Making games is hard. Critiquing them is easy. 2019 represents the end of a decade. In my next video, I'm going to run down my favorite games from the last 10 years. I hope you'll join me then for a celebration of some great games. Happy New Year.